Well, it's six o'clock now, uh, everybody. So I think we'd like to start. Um, so welcome everybody. And I'm delighted to see you joining us today uh, for Saku's panel, which is called Bridging Anglo-Chinese Understanding Through, Through Education. Uh, my name is Zoe Reed, and I'm the, the chair of SACU. Um, and from, from SACU's point of view, it's particularly great to have such a, a distinguished uh, panel to talk about this topic, because SACU, the Society for Anglo-Chinese Understanding, has been promoting people-to-people -people, uh, friendship and understanding between UK and China for 55, 56 years now. So this um, topic is particularly pertinent to, to, to our mission. Um, Barnaby Powell, who's one of our council members, is the is, is the, the the actual chair of today's uh, panel, and we're running the meeting shortly when I hand over to him um, and introducing all our speakers. So my role and that of Ros Wong, who's also uh, on on the panel today, um, she's our our membership secretary. We're just the tech support. We're just here to try and press the buttons and and get the right things in in the right order. Um, so in, in terms of tech support, can I remind people that there is a, a Q&A function, so please do log any questions you want uh, the panel to consider, consider there. We've had a number of questions sent in in advance, which is absolutely great, um, and obviously any questions we can't get to uh, during the proceedings, we will hope to, to respond to um, uh, in some fashion um, afterwards. Um, so do, do put any Q&A you see there. Just to remind people, because there's different formats for all these sorts of things, that this is what's called a webinar, which means um, that the panel uh, can't see you and can't hear you, uh, and you can't see and hear one another, but you can see the panel. So that's just, it's kind of slightly odd, but that's just so everybody knows kind of what, what's going on. Um, what Ros and I are going to try and remember to do is to press the spotlight button so that when the speaker is speaking like I am now, hopefully you can only see me and not the rest of the panel uh, members. Um, but if you do have the function called view on your technology, then you can also select speaker view, not gallery view. And again, you'll, you'll get a better picture of the, of the people when, when, they're, when they're speaking. So that's all from me in terms of tech. I'm going to turn off my speaker view now and turn it on to uh, Barnaby, who will introduce himself and the speakers. Hello, good evening, and welcome to SACU's uh, Public Education Initiative. Uh, this is highlighting the importance of education in advancing Anglo-Chinese understanding. Uh, with the end of the so-called golden era, what my two daughters described when they were younger as warm fuzzies in the relationship between uh, China and, and, and this country have tended to become more like cold quicklies. So if we're really to enjoy what Mr. Xi Jinping calls a shared future and a common destiny, then we do need to get to know each other, each other, each other's needs rather better if we're to reconcile our differences and cultural values. So as, as Zoe suggested, we have an excellent panel. I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, Tim Clussell is a well-known writer on China. Uh, Deeply famous for his first book, Mr. China, and several others. He's a senior research associate at Cambridge and uh, probably best known as a champion of introducing the study of Chinese civilization in schools. Uh, Teresa Booth is co CEO of the Chopsticks Club, whose Engaged with China initiative focuses on building China literacy across all ages in schools. Uh, Professor David Law is academic director of global partnerships at Keele University and the author of the Higher Education Institute's report on UK higher education institutes export to China. Uh, Lucy Yang is a senior language tutor and language coordinator supporting Chinese teaching and learning at four Confucius classrooms and 20 link schools at the Confucius Institute at the University of Manchester. So without further ado, if I could move on to ask Tim to give us his ideas, uh, chiefly on the need to raise awareness through the study of China and, and chiefly Chinese civilization in school for a start. Yeah, th thanks very much, Barnaby. Um, so um, you, you asked me to um, talk for about, I don't know, eight minutes or so about an in initiative that I've been uh, working on to try to promote teaching about Chinese civilization in English in UK schools. So um, it really came about from uh, a very sort of personal experience rather than any sort of grand strategy. 
Um, and that was, I lived in Beijing for something like 20 years. And um, I basically brought up um, four kids there. And um, we were pretty integrated in the, into the uh, Chinese part of life in, in, in China. We didn't kind of live too much in an expat bubble. So what my eldest son actually went to number five, number 55 middle school. Um, and we returned to the UK in um, 2015, sorry, 2005, when, when my kids were in the range of between eight and 16 and they went to the state school. So we got a kind of quite a good view of what the options were to continue their interest in China, in the state system in the UK. And they were very limited and of quite low quality. And that just got me thinking. Um, so I, I offered to teach um, kind of self um, written course on, on China at the local sixth form, just in the general studies um, uh, slot on a Monday morning. So I've got an hour every Monday morning for something like six weeks or something. Um, and that was really interesting. It's quite surprising because um, the, the sixth forms were interested in China, but they weren't interested in the bits that I would have expected them to be interested in. So they're extremely interested in um, the, the role of diet in uh, Chinese society, uh, diet and medicine, the role of geography in the way that China developed, not particularly interested in the belief systems like Confucianism, Taoism and so on. Uh, all, of course, wanted to know how to write their names in Chinese characters and so on. But then if you actually got into the language at any depth, then kind of attention waved. But that, that whole um, experience, it got me thinking because we have a really basic problem that you can articulate fairly simply, I think, which is the Chinese know more about us than we know about them. And that gives that results in us having a competitive disadvantage. So it doesn't matter what your position is on China, because you know, knowing more about the opposite party helps you to co cooperate if you're in that mindset. Um, but it also helps you defend your own values if you're at, at that um, part of the spectrum. Um, so, so I, you know, I hoped that the idea of um, raising the knowledge of um, China in, in UK society would kind of be welcomed. So, um, so I started trying to think about how to kind of put something together. And um, I, uh, uh, there was a period when I homeschooled my kids. And uh, that, that meant that I had to look at the A-level syllabuses quite closely. And I was very impressed with the changes in the way the education system worked for certain a level. So, for example, in biology, the biology A level now includes molecular genetics, which when I did it, it didn't that didn't really even exist. Geography includes climate change. Okay, so the individual A levels have developed and moved with the times, but the offering overall hasn't developed. So, if you think in our lifetimes, kind of one of the most probably the most important change in our lifetimes is globalization, and China is absolutely critical to that process. Um, and yet there's virtually no content in the A-level A offering um, about China, except for Mandarin. And um, the, the, Ma the Mandarin um, teaching is fantastic um, in the earlier years, but it hits, it hits a major problem at A-level. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one is that the cohort is very small and it's dominated by uh, Chinese nationals who um, are studying here at sixth form. So it's extremely difficult for a non-native speaker to get good grades and that people that puts um, people off studying it at the critical time to go to um, university. It's also perceived as being very difficult. Um, and finally, one of the problems is that as far as I know, or certainly when I started this process, there aren't any universities in the UK that assume anything other than ab initio. Right, so even if you did do Mandarin A level, then the, the kind of wasn't much point in doing because you have to start again. So, so the, 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 the numbers of people doing Mandarin A level are tiny. And I could quote them off the top of my head. They're basically over the last three years, it's gone from 3,000 to 2,000 to 1,000 people doing um, A level Mandarin out of a cohort of about 800,000. So it's essentially negligible. So, so that really means that there isn't, there isn't any kind of serious teaching in terms of numbers. Um, at um, you know sixth form, so what what I what I tried to do and you, uh, sorry and the, the final point is because you've got all this 
excellent teaching of Mandarin at junior school and then through the earlier years and even up to GCSE, but then nobody takes it at A level. You've got a disrupted learning journey and it switches people off so they don't continue studying um, you know, things Chinese at university. So what I want to do is try, and try to bridge that gap in a kind of a realistic way. Um, so we basically came up with um, an idea to try and create an A-level in Chinese civilization that's taught in English, okay? So the obvious parallel would be the um, A-level of classical civilization vis-a-vis -vis Latin. So that's really what I'm, I'm trying to create something that's like the classical civilization that gives people who don't want to study Latin the option of continuing that general interest. So here, what you'd be doing is you'd have an A-level that was taught in English on the Chinese civilization, um, instead of having to take the risk and the full plunge into Mandarin A-level. Um, so so the, the, essentially the way that the system works in the UK is that new A-levels have to originate, the demand for new A-levels has to originate from Britain's universities. So that's where I started. So um, I basically went around universities talking to, um, you know, basically the leading China scholars in the country at lots of different universities, London, Nottingham, Manchester, Sheffield, Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, Bath, uh, was where I started in Edinburgh. And I got a very good reaction from the scholars. I mean, you would get a good reaction from the scholars because that's what they want to teach. Um, so essentially I coordinated the um, creation of a, a syllabus and a way of assessing and then awarding the qualification. So that was done something like five or six years ago. And I think that the syllabus is absolutely excellent. You know, it covers all, a very wide range of topics with all sorts of different options and so on. Um, and then I went and met with the vice chancellors of um, 10 universities. And uh, all of them, again, these, they, so they, these were not the China scholars. They're the people who are kind of running, running the universities. And again, that was um, uh, King's College London, Leeds, Nottingham, Manchester, uh, Cambridge, Oxford, there were 10 of them all together. Um, and, and they um, all agreed that it was an excellent idea and wanted to do it and, and, and all of them signed a support letter. And the next thing I had to do was find an exam board who would actually set the exam and award the qualification. I managed to find an exam board that was interested and they then did marketing research in, in schools. And I wasn't privy to that because they had to keep it private, but they went ahead, so it obviously must have been pos positive. And then finally, um, I managed to find some private financing for it, so it doesn't even need taxpayers' money. So you've got a completely kind of oven ready, to use that awful expression, uh, A level, which could be rolled out into schools, but it needs to be qualified, it needs to be um, approved by Ofqual. And in order to get um, off, off qual to approve it, you have to get the Department for Education to sign off on it. And I haven't found any way that I can persuade the Department for Education to approve this to go ahead, which is very, very frustrating. And um, so I've met with the schools minister and I've lobbied civil servants and I just can't get it through the, uh, the DfE. Uh, and I've been trying for something like two and a half years or something. So personally, I find the Chinese government much more transparent and easy to deal with, but uh, that's basically because of my experience. But if anybody's got you know, bright ideas about how to persuade civil servants in the DfE to look at this option seriously, and it, it's a very serious option. It's, you know, it's backed by top scholars in, in the country, uh, you know, uh, China scholars, plus 10 vice chancellors of leading universities. So. Um, yeah, I'm kind of sort of stuck. And if anybody has any bright ideas, it would be great if you could uh, make some suggestions. So that's sort of where I am. Kim, thank you very much. That's great stuff. I mean, you and I are part of a vanguard, I think. We, we've seen the future and how it must work. Uh, the question is how to get people on, on the side in the sense that it's their future and the shared future is one they're going to be part of. Um, it, it, it's quite, it's quite a, just just one one very quick point. It's quite interesting that the um, the group, the China Research Group of MPs, um, actually are quite keen on this, which you sort of almost think it was count, counterintuitive. But the the China Research Group of MPs, headed by Tom Tugendhat, are yeah. quite keen on it because they they, they recognise that you know my, my my personal enthusiasm about China is that I want people to understand. China in order to be able to cooperate better. 
Right. But there's also um, a cohort of people who see China as being very dangerous and it needs to be countered and we need to defend our values. They also think that we need to know more about them. So actually, it's quite a strange alliance. It's a very, very broad alliance. Absolutely. But I can't make this breakthrough with the Department for Education. Right. OK, along those lines, um, building what Theresa Booth has called China literacy, which is really what we're talking about, in other words, knowledge of China as well as language and culture. Um, can I pass the baton now to Theresa to speak about uh, Engage with China, which she organizes through the Chopsticks Club? Yes, thank you very much, Barnaby and Zoe, for inviting me to be a panelist today. Yes, we, the Chopsticks Club, set up a educational charity um, called Engage with China about three years ago, specifically to build China literacy. So that's cultural, political, everything you can think of relating to China in all UK schools and at all, um, all ages. And I, I would pick up just on what Tim said I mean, the, the key reason is that our pupils are being disadvantaged yeah. um, in, in the global marketplace for not knowing more about China. And we, um, I'll show you a slide in a minute, um, which was a response from the Department of Education from um, the Right Honorable Nick Gibb. In fact, why don't I just show it to you now? And it, it basically his his response to a letter about our program um, showed that he did understand there was a real need to educate all UK pupils in the UK about China. I'll just see if I'll find the slide now. Um, there you go. Here we go. I, I hope you can all see this one. But this was his response to um, a letter we wrote to him about the program, saying that China is a country of huge strategic importance to the UK, and education plays a key role in developing that wider relationship with significant economic, educational, and diplomatic benefits. So the, the UK government clearly understands that need. Um, Right, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the programme itself. Let's uh, just make sure I can... Oh, hold on. Let's go back. I have to start again, I think, on these. Okay, I hope you can all see that. The, the, the programme that we're currently running and delivering, and we've delivered it already to thousands of UK school, school children, it's a China cultural enrichment programme. And it's, it's different, obviously, for different age groups. And we do have a, an ancient Chinese civilization um, six hour course for seven year olds. And then we go right up to A-levels where we've created um, lesson plans, which are China themed lesson plans that fit into history, geography, politics, um, economics and, and religious A-level syllabuses. But it's all China themed. And then in addition to these lesson plans that we've developed, we have challenge days where we have face-to-face, -face, um, well, we go into schools and have a face-to-face -face day of activities, China-related activities. And these are, uh, we've sort of, they include lots of, sort of soft skills like negotiating at older levels or role play or problem solving. So, you know, where, where some of the, Sort of mainstream curriculum has we've edited to make it China themed. So they'll have math problems, which, for example, calculate um, the population of China, or they weigh the population. In this photograph, you can see here, they've been weighing the population of China against other countries. 
So there's all sorts of China related activities so that they they get a real feel for the size and scale of China and 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 what how it's going to impact their lives, which we truly believe it, it will. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Um, we, we're also doing it. One that I'm picking up on one of the other reasons for doing it is the importance of having a, a global mindset and understanding a different culture. And if you ask any recruitment agencies what sort of skills are they looking, they're looking for, having a global mindset and getting on with your team is hugely important to companies. So it, 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 it's not, and China being the most important country, we feel our program, um, or that it's very much appreciated by the schools, but it needs to be supported by the government too. Um, one, one of our biggest problems, um, apart from the fact that because of COVID restrictions, we can't go into schools at the moment, um, is timetabling, trying to find a, a day where we can, it fits into the, the school timetable. Um, and another, another issue currently is the sort of anti-China uh, sentiment when you're talking to school team leaders where if the, the head isn't, doesn't approve of what the Chinese government is doing, we can't go into the schools. But generally speaking, um, there is a huge, huge hunger for our program. And the only reason at the moment we're not able to roll it out even further is lack of funding. So one of my um, uh, sort of Please here is if you know anyone who would like to support our program with, with um, sponsorship, or you could provide help maybe with, if you're a retired teacher and you can help with lesson plans, we would really, really like to hear from you. Right, I think that that's, I'll just see if there's, um, Yes, I think that that is it, Barnaby. I've been I've completed in record time. And there you've got all the contact details. Yes, here we go. I hope you can see all those contact details. If you if you are able to help us with funders who might be interested in our program, and the most important thing is obviously our website. Well, there you have it. I have to admit an interest uh, that I am a champion of the Chopsticks Club. And if you're not a member, I would encourage you to join because of their wonderful activities they do in advancing this cause. Um, Teresa, thank you very much. And we'll pick you up later. Thank you. Um, next, if I could ask um, Professor David Law uh, to tell us a bit more about his uh, Higher Education Institute work uh, in encouraging uh, exports to China um, of education and, and encouraging and fomenting a mutual exchange of learning. Thank you, Barnaby. Uh, good evening to all. Pleasure to be with you. And I will tell you a little bit about relationships between British universities and Chinese universities. The report that I wrote was really a factual report. And it was, I think, designed primarily to try and help everyone understand how important the relationship is between Chinese higher education and UK higher education. Uh, when I worked through the figures, it seemed to me that it is uh, perfectly reasonable to say that pre-pandemic, higher education was the UK's biggest export to China. Uh, I don't think this is commonly recognized. Um, people in universities, I think, know that there are a lot of Chinese students in British universities, but I'm not sure that even in universities, we understand quite how valuable this is. Although I don't want to measure the interactions simply in monetary terms. But let me just say a little bit about the facts of the matter. Um, if we take together the tuition fees paid by Chinese students, some of them, of course, are here on scholarships, but many, many are not. Um, indeed, probably 80% of tuition fees are paid for privately. Uh, but taking together tuition fees 
and expenditure of Chinese students in this country. Pre-pandemic, uh, the value of that was roughly four billion pounds. That is enormous. Uh, the value of uh, machine exports to China, motor vehicles and things like that was uh, about three billion pounds in, in the last full year. Uh, the value of gold, incidentally, is the highest category, but as far as I know, not much gold is mined in the UK. So this is actually a processing uh, issue for uh, the exports of gold to, to, to China. Second highest was petroleum. And again, although we've got North Sea oil, a lot of the petroleum, the petroleum products that go to China uh, actually come from imported oil from the Middle East. So if, if one was to take all the calculations in a reasonable way, I think we can say that higher education is the biggest export to China. But my, my theme really, I think, is, is less about the value of this, or more about the importance of it. Um, my job is to encourage partnership development between my university and Chinese university. My passion is to promote international understanding and particularly, of course, understanding between the UK and China. The context uh, of, of the work around Chinese partnerships and universities uh, working with China is first of all student numbers. Uh, there are uh, approaching half a million students from outside the UK studying at British universities, a lot of students studying at British universities from many, many countries. Uh, 140,000, according to the latest data, come from the People's Republic of China. And then, uh, of course, there are other Chinese from other territories and administrations, including, of course, Hong Kong. So the number of Chinese students in British universities is very large, and the value to the universities is very large. Uh, but the interactions go well beyond uh, the, the student uh, contact. There are possibly 5,000 Chinese academic staff uh, in British universities. Um, research contacts between uh, China and the UK are now very, very large. And this is something that's happened really over the last 20 years. If we look at student numbers, for example, there were about 4,000 Chinese students in 1998 in British universities, and that's now gone up to roughly 140,000. If we look at research, uh, there were 100 co-authored papers between British academics and Chinese academics uh, in 1990. That grew to about 750 in 2000. But by 2019, the uh, number of co-authored papers was over 16,000. So about 11% of UK output were joint author program papers uh, with Chinese colleagues. Generally, of course, written in, in English because a lot of publishing in China takes place in, in English. Um, if I can give you the statistic for joint authorship with the United States, about 19% of British research papers have a US co-author uh, and about the same percentage as with China, uh, with, with Germany, so around 11% with, with Germany. So universities, of course, are by their very nature international organizations. But I must express some disappointment, and it really matches the kind of disappointment that Tim has been expressing about the teaching of Chinese in British universities, both the teaching of Mandarin, but in a way more importantly, and I was very struck by what Tim had to say in his presentation, uh, uh, more importantly, the, the understanding of China, because you don't have to be able to speak Mandarin in order to understand a good deal about China. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure if I was getting disturbance there. Um, so I, I, I do think that in British universities, we could do a lot more as well as uh, in, in, in schools, do a lot more to teach about China. There is just not enough taught about China. 
in conclusion, what I'd like to say is that uh, the Chinese are extremely enthusiastic about contact with foreign universities. And this is government policy. Uh, it's government policy for a very good reason. It's government policy, of course, under Deng Xiaoping and, and subsequent to Deng Xiaoping, uh, because it was a part of reform and opening up. There was very little contact uh, between Chinese higher education and uh, foreign higher education before the 1980s, but it has grown enormously. In addition to the 140,000 students uh, studying in British universities on the campuses in the UK, there's possibly another 40,000 students, many of them studying for four degrees, who never leave China, who are there in China studying on various kinds of programs that British universities have in China. And there's great enthusiasm from Chinese colleagues in the Chinese universities for this kind of contact. So I'm expressing both hope that this will grow. It is under some political threat. There are um, opposition, there are uh, political lobbying groups, uh, particularly within the Conservative Party, that would like to see this restricted. Uh, there have been some positive remarks about Tom Tugendhat, and I don't want to be personal about the China Research Group. I think it does some useful things, uh, but also um, they have given support to those groups in the Conservative Party that would like to restrict contacts between China and, and the UK. So I think it, it cuts both ways. Uh, so I'll conclude at that and happy to come in in the Q&A part. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That's, that's really interesting. Um, got a brief comment on my part, you know, having done time on the ground there, which is really the only way to learn a language. Um, the world speaks English, and because the world speaks English, we too often assume that we don't have to bother with even learning French, which used to be the first foreign language we, we learned, or German. Mandarin, and you may believe what I'm telling you, for somebody who's a bit cloth here, is a very pleasant language. It's not so difficult, uh, obviously, to learn to read and write. It takes a bit of time and dedication. But it is important that you do appreciate that the Chinese, probably 400 million of them, are engaged in learning English. And there are slogans up in the street in China that read, you know, English equals success, which is a bit crude, but nonetheless true, I suppose, for most of them. So what is a lingua franca in the Far East is Chinese. I've used it all over. Um, my wife has talked to people who really want to learn in two weeks, you can get people up to speed so they can navigate their way around on the ground when they arrive there for the first time. Uh, it's actually easier to speak once you've got the music of it than either French or German to my, to my understanding. Anyhow, um, the amount of exchange that's going on needs to be raised because we badly need to dissipate this growing hostility that's growing as we the world tends to sort of hive off into two main blocks of opposing ideology, which is rather daft. Um, so we are trying to be the, the, the wedge that, uh, that tries to interpose itself to form some sort of welding, if I can mix metaphors. Um, now, let us come to the, the last uh, of our speakers, Lucy Yang, who is actually a practitioner of teaching Chinese. Um, at the University of Manchester's Computer Institute, and she will tell us some of the problems and joys of teaching Mandarin Chinese in schools and at the Institute. So Lucy, if I could turn to you now. Uh, Lucy's on mute. Oh, sorry. Thanks, Barnaby. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lucy Yang, and I'm the language tutor and uh, teaching coordinator at the University of Manchester Confucius Institute. So it's my great honor to have the opportunity to take part in this Saku discussion panel. So here I'm going to um, introduce you um, what we, our Confucius Institute, do to promote language uh, Chinese language and culture. So um, 
the Chinese, the Confucius Institute at University of Manchester actually was launched in 2006. This year is the 15th year already. Um, a partnership between the University of Manchester, the Chinese International Education Foundation, and the Beijing Normal University, where the second Confucius Institute established in the UK. So there are actually more than over 5,000 or 500 Confucius Institutes around the world, and each one serves its community in a different way. Here um, in Manchester, our focus is on the following four key areas. Chinese teaching, learning, and the testing, promotion of contemporary China, education exchange, and engagement with China. So our main purpose is the teaching of Chinese language through our evening and weekend classes, school partnerships, and teacher training programs. Secondly, we aim to encourage a broader and a deeper understanding of Chinese culture and the contemporary China through our vibrant public events program. Over the last 15 years, we have taught over 20,000 of students, built links with over 40 schools in the region, and work, worked with major cultural festivals all over the city, establishing ourselves at the center of Chinese language teaching and the hub for Chinese culture in the Northwest. So now I would like to talk about some major things we do regarding each aspects. So the first one is the language teaching, learning and the testing. We are the sector leader in the Chinese language teaching and learning in the Northwest, especially with the use of ICT online and the blended learning. We are the Chinese teacher training center in the Northwest with regular training programs for local and seconded Chinese teachers. We also work with local universities in PGCE program, helping to train the training in order to get the qualified teaching status in the UK. We support local schools and communities with their language learning needs and enriching the cultural diversity. For example, we have eight core schools plus an ex extensive network of 30 schools so far, among which we have four Confucius classrooms. They are Ohalo's Catholic College, um, Bolton School for Boys, Gladings, Preparatory School and St. Paul's Church of England Primary School. In 2020, we sent out four full time teachers in local, some of the local schools and delivered teaching in link schools, including Stockport Grammar School, Chido Hume, um, Phillips High, and Disbury High. Teaching continued at Stockport Grammar through the year, despite the national lockdown with recorded lessons for the teachers. And as soon as after the, the, as the lockdown lifted, then we also sent teachers to the school to teach face-to-face. -face. Regular communication and resource sharing to ensure that Chinese language learning and is fully supported during the pandemic. We are, also, we are a key Chinese language testing center in the North offering HSK, HSKK, and YCT tests, and support GCC and A-level Chinese preparation. We also offer scholarships to study in China. So here are some pictures and should um, in the past uh, in some of our link schools and Confucius in uh, Confucius classrooms. Um, and the second aspect is to promote contemporary China. We work with national and regional cultural organizations in promoting mutual understanding between UK and China through cultural activities such as exhibitions, films, literature, science, performances, music, and sports. We act as cultural advisor to national and regional governments for China-related activities, including Chinese New Year and other festival celebrations. We are a champion of the university social responsibilities through participation of um, University of Manchester Community Festival every July and the Blue Dot Science and the Music Festival and working with local charities. We also act as a bridge between the Chinese students and the local communities by offering intercultural experience. So here are some of, of the organizations that uh, we work with, as you can see. And 
Regarding engagement with China, we promote public engagement of researchers who contact China-related research through rice funding and linking up with Chinese institutions. We contribute to the university's China engagement strategy. We support faculties and schools as well as academics with their China engagement activities with advice on language, cultural, or wildness and contacts. Also deliver Chinese uh, language and cultural training to local organizations. We also deliver UK higher education and the intercultural training to Chinese universities. Um, regarding supporting st uh, student staff, we also do translation services. We support students and staff well-being through advice and uh, activities and uh, enrich campus life with intercultural activities. Now, I would like to show you the 10 carefully selected photos at our CI and what did we do in 2020 last year. So here is one of the, our Chinese teacher playing Gu Zheng. Uh, you know, Chinese um, Ziza is called Ziza, the Chinese traditional instrument. Um, and in the Chinese New Year at the Manchester Art Gallery. And actually here, this is me. Um, I'm writing calligraphy um, for the customers in Selfridges in order to celebrate Chinese New Year. We do this every year for several years now. And we also organize other cultural activities. For example, we do cooking classes, um, for example, making dumplings and making Chinese, Chinese ding song um, like that. And uh, since the pandemic, um, we also moved most of our um, cultural and language activities online via Zoom. So here is one of our um, teacher doing the Chinese qigong. It's one kind of the Chinese uh, martial art online. And tutorial videos. And we also do some expressions. So here is a Heilongjiang Black Earth Woodblock Prince expression at our Manchester Business School. And we also um, published a book of Shanghai together with the Koma and Press and the University of Shanghai. And we also invited the, the author of the um, book of Shanghai to give us a talk online. Um, we actually we um, organize monthly um, public talk inviting all experts and scholars um, and to talk about Chinese culture and the other things like we had one on Taoism last year. Um, also, we we ha we also ha uh, hold like teacher training conferences every year. So, like this one we held last year, that's the fifth international symposium on Chinese language teaching and learning. We invited the renowned um, experts of teaching and researching Chinese language languages from um, Stanford University and other renowned universities in America, in China, and in the UK. And um, this is one of our teacher doing the Zoom language teaching um, with uh, adult students. And uh, so um, actually um, since the March of last year, we um, transferred all of our, our Chinese teaching course to Zoom lesson. So, and we re actually received a positive feedback. And um, so actually, um, so I also actually, let me, so um, I know that uh, last two years are two exceptional years um, for us, and uh, um, especially due to the pandemic of the COVID-19. So being the Chinese uh, coordinator and the senior line tutor, um, I led on the development of Chinese courses, quality assurance, process, and the inducting and the supporting new teachers, um, together with the uh, directors of CI, I helped with the smooth transition to online teaching and effectively incorporated ICT to ensure the quality of online learning. Um, in addition, I also conducted research into um, the online teaching platforms and the students' experience and uh, wrote a research paper and was also published in the International Journal of Chinese Language Teaching last year. So this year we focused on the doing like developing an online Chinese beginner course. So hopefully by the end of 
next year, um, all of you could uh, try the online language teaching course developed from uh, by us. So during the pandemic year, we are increasing our online presence in support of local schools and the communities to great effect. We came up with new ideas with using Chinese culture to support staff and the students' well-being. Manchester CI has demonstrated that it has a sustainable model despite the drastic change of external environment and maintains its position as the leading center of Chinese language and learning and the cultural exchange. Um, this is what I would like to share. I believe with the support of um, organizations such as our CI or SACU and all of you, the people to people exchange and the intercultural communication between the UK and China can be strengthened in the future. Thank you for your listening. Lucy, thank you very much. I'd like to come straight back to you actually in what you said. I think people in this country are very inquisitive about what actually happens in the classroom in China. So although the syllabus is roughly similar to what we study, um, the style and the discipline is rather different in China. And we've read, uh, you probably some of you have seen, um, there's been a sort of reversion to a Confucian uh, style of teaching and they've set up special Confucian schools with a special uniform. Um, tell us, uh, how would that compare with uh, the experience you have of uh, of teaching Mandarin in classrooms in state schools in England, and what could a British teacher take away from shadowing some of your lessons, do you think? Uh, thank you for your question, Manabe. Um, yes, there's, of course, there's a very huge difference between the Chinese and the English teaching, um, um, teaching methodology um, in, the, in two different countries. So, um, because I grew up in China for, let me see, um, over 20 years and before I came into the UK. And also I had some experience of teaching um, English students uh, in um, primary schools, secondary schools, and also in uh, universities. So I actually experienced a lot of the cultural difference, the teaching and methodology, methodology difference and uh, the the way of thinking are different as well. So I think in the um, primary and, and secondary schools in China, um, and Chinese, the, the, the way of teaching is more like a lecture. Yes. Um, and the students, they just uh, busy um, with like uh, listen to what the teacher said and they take notes and mm -hmm. uh, they need to memorize mm -hmm. and key, the key contents. Um, so a lot of memorization, memorization and uh, going, um, you know, you need to do um, in order to get a good score in the exam, especially I, I noticed someone mentioned Gaokao, you know, the college mm. entrance examination in China. So, yeah, um, but um, I guess in the Western countries, like in the UK, critical thinking and the, uh, creativity is more emphasized, no matter in yeah. um, and young adult, uh, young people's teaching or adult teaching. So, um, because I uh, studied um, in UK universities as well, so I feel um, like I still remember the first essays I I wrote, and the feedback from uh, my um, mentor said, um, "Very good, but lack critical thinking." Yeah. Um, uh, in the first, I, I got quite uh, surprised because I think I cited you know a lot of methods from all the books i read and uh, i also gave examples um in the in my practice like the, as teaching chinese how uh, i prove all the experts said are correct but um i just don't have the i don't know i don't have the mindset of um say um to be critical thinking i mean um to say something different from what the previous expert said in the books I read. I think um, that's, that is the first thing I feel quite shocked when I study in the UK. Um, and uh, I guess um, regarding the question like the Chinese entrance examination in China, um, I think um, 
it has the benefits and disadvantages so because every chrome has two sides has two sides right so i i think although um it's uh, the the design in china um not uh, emphasize on critical thinking and uh, creativity but it does give um all the students a very uh, how to say equal and a fair opportunity to um to get to the good universities top universities in china and uh, then after that again good jobs so in that case it is more equal than the you know primary education uh, secondary education here and you don't have a huge um differences um, in china no matter you are from a, a like very poor mountain area or you are in middle class or you are quite rich in china so through the the same one exam once a year and um, then you will um get to you know the school uh, the university um according only according to your uh the exam score so in in some way it's quite um you know mm, fair so give be, being able to give everyone the equal opportunity to climb the social status ladder if you would like to say yeah so i know here if you are rich then you go to private schools and you get a better education if not maybe you don't have the chance to get uh, the elite education so but i admit that i really like the teaching methodology in the uk and i try to um and train our Chinese teachers who just uh, from China to adapt to the local um, cutting edge um, teaching method to and adapt to, to our language courses. So I found it's quite um, efficient to do like that. Yeah, I suppose that's the key difference, isn't it? I remember going to university. It's always a shock here because the professor or your tutor says, I expect you to argue with me. Whereas in China, you're not invited. You're not invited to challenge the teacher, are you? It, you know, so it's a huge yeah. effort, a feat of, of, of memorization. And uh, those who are most diligent and applied will rise on exam scores and probably end up running the country. Um, whereas here, we tend to uh, go off and do all sorts of things and are not always, always very productive. Um, so there's merit in both. But it is a question of merit, isn't it? That the, the arbiter of, of success is in China is merit based on um, competition, fierce competition, isn't it? That's my take on it. Yeah. Um, now, a, a question for Tim. Um, obviously, in advancing his idea of um, gaining a much better appreciation of China uh, through study of its history and culture and literature, I have an interesting question from Tom White, who's been teaching there. Um, you know, what, what would he recommend to read? I mean, I, for example, when I first arrived in the Chinese world, read a long time ago now, Mr. Lin Yutang, who studied in the West and introduced the whole notion of humor to Chinese culture in a way. And he wrote uh, wonderfully um, in some of his books. But Tom suggests that, um, should, or que questions whether students in the UK should study people like Li Bai and Du Fu, who are the great poets in school, uh, to gain an understanding of the Chinese mindset? Or, or what else do you think would be more productive in, in, in gaining an entry into the mindset of the Chinese? It's quite, that's quite an interesting um, question. So I, I've just written um, a book which translates, it explains the background of Du Fu and Li Bai and um, translates about 50 of the poems. And I chose them because I thought that they were poems that would kind of chime most with um, just sort of basic human feelings that transcend all civilizations and so on and it was a really really interesting process because obviously i've kind of got contacts in the publishing industry through having written before but with this book on levi and dufa i couldn't even get a single agent to agree to read it let, let alone promote it or take it to a publisher um so so there's a tremendous um kind of um, antipathy to anything that's got any kind of level of complexity, I think. Yeah. Um, so so in, in terms of, um, so, so in, in, in that instance, what I actually did was I then switched to a Chinese publisher. Yeah. So it's being published in English in China by the commercial press, it's actually dual yeah. language. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that I will be able to publish it eventually in uh, you know, Western countries, but I basically I couldn't find anybody to even look at it. Um, so in terms of what you should read, it sort of really depends what you want to do, what you want to achieve. So I would say if you want to understand the way modern society works, I would go for something like The Search for Modern China by um, Jonathan Spence, which basically yeah. you know, historiography starting late Ming yeah. and it takes right up to Xi Jinping. Yeah. Yeah. Because I personally believe that the way of understanding the current Chinese government is to understand the imperial system of government, because the because the ethic of the ideal scholar official is basically still the same. Um, so if you want to just, uh, understand that, if you want to understand um, the kind of the d deep kind of ethics of um, Chinese traditional thought, I think Peter Nolan is one of the best writers. Um, on, on that aspect. So he's um, a professor at Cambridge and um, he has written a book called China in the West, which contrasts the different ethical systems in China and uh, in Western society. I think that Nolan is one of the best um, thinkers about China um, anywhere at the moment. So th those are the two books that immediately spring to mind. Great, thanks very much. There you are, people who want to know the key to the door on China, which is what we all need short of actually going there. I mean, the great classics are great fun, but what I found too, to share with you, the difficulty of getting publishers interested is that I sold many more copies of my books uh, in, in the East, you know, which is a yeah. because there's a huge hunger for knowledge, which yeah. seems, you know, reluctant to pursue. And how do you spark this, I wonder? Uh, probably it'll be born of necessity where we need to understand. Right, exactly. It's not actually speaking the language, which is a tall order although it's not so fiendishly difficult, at least to have some gateway into their mindset through the literature, which is important. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Um, okay, well, let us move on. And can I perhaps ask David? I have an interesting question here. Um, I'll read it because it's um, not too complex. Uh, despite the efforts of the British Council over the last 20 years to promote Mandarin teaching and learning in schools, as well as the work of the Confucius Institutes, understanding of China and the Chinese people remains woefully inadequate, with public perceptions becoming more and more negative. Um, do you reckon these programs through the British Council and other, others have made any real difference? And what more could be done in terms of education? Thank you very much. Um, the colleague from Manchester, uh, Lucy, was talking about the work of the Confucius Institute and I had uh, a happy couple of years being the British co-director of a Confucius Institute in another university. And there are a, around 30 Confucius Institutes in, in British universities and all of these institutes do good work in helping uh, their communities, not simply the university, but their wider communities, uh, understand something about China. But it's not enough. And I think Tim made a really important point right at the start in saying that the Chinese know more about us than we know about them. If I reflect on my own academic career, I went into Russian studies, first of all, as a graduate student, having uh, studied history at Sussex in, in the late 60s, and having been quite influenced, of course, by political events of the, those years, having been very influenced by um, the Cultural Revolution, believing, I think, quite naively uh, that uh, the anti-bureaucratic approach of the Cultural Revolution was genuine. I think that is probably uh, a woeful misinterpretation. And being a, a member of SACU uh, in the uh, early 70s and reading work of Joan Robinson and other authors, uh, and I think there was a, a quite a high degree of naivety. Now, I mentioned Russian studies because, of course, the reason why we had Russian studies uh, in a big way in the UK uh, was because of the Hater Report and the need to advance the teaching of Russian and the understanding of the USSR because we were in the middle of a Cold War. We now don't see uh, the global situation any longer as one of Cold War 
generally speaking. There are some who might still use that term. But the understanding of major powers in the world is really extremely important. And I don't think in the long term we can allow the UK to know a lot less about China than China knows about the UK. And this is not simply a question of great, great power politics. More importantly, it's a question of solving world problems, that we will not solve the problem of climate change without cooperation with the Chinese. We will not understand the problems of getting to uh, net zero carbon uh, without working with the Chinese. And a lot has been done in the last few years. Xi Jinping's pledge to the United Nations, I think, was extremely important in this. I think it's difficult to work out exactly how we can all contribute most effectively to the better understanding of China. We all work in the ways that we do in the organizations that we are part of, and we try to encourage a better understanding. Although I am really a, a manager, I still manage to do a little bit of teaching on Chinese history, and I'm very pleased to have that opportunity because, frankly, there's nobody else in Keel University, not a Russell Group University, but a well-respected university, there's nobody else in Keel University who can teach any Chinese history at all. And so as an honorary professor, not a, a tenured professor at all, but as an honorary professor, I'm very pleased when the history section gives me the opportunity to go in front of students and tell them a little bit about Chinese history. I think it's extremely important that we do do that. One plea I would make for all those in a position to do this is to listen to your Chinese colleagues. As I mentioned earlier, there are possibly 5,000 Chinese academics in the UK. One of the reasons for the big growth of co-authorship in research papers, of course, is that there has been a huge diaspora, which in uh, many cases has now returned to China with a Thousand Talents program. So there are many people working in Chinese universities who have their PhDs and, and academic experience from the USA, from the UK, from Australia, and from many other countries. And those people are uh, our natural collaborators. And I think we should be working with them both in China and of course, before uh, they go back to China. And let's hope they do go back to China because the Chinese universities can now offer extremely promising academic career routes for Chinese academics. They don't have to stay in the USA or the UK anymore. We need to listen to them. One of the things that my university does and many other universities do similar things is that we have a China group. We have uh, a group that which discusses the issues of relating to Chinese universities where can we build partnerships? So it's not simply a managerial issue about what do the senior managers of the university want to do. It's also listening carefully to what our Chinese colleagues think is an appropriate line of approach. One of the things that we'll be doing in, in the next couple of years, I very much hope, is to create one of these joint education institutes in China. There are about 30 of these now in China. There are some very high profile joint institutes where a number of degree programs are taught jointly. We hope to do one in Chengdu uh, with a traditional Chinese medicine university. And I think that kind of activity is extremely good for helping the university as a whole understand better how to relate to Chinese universities. But in the end, I think it comes back to what do we teach our students? And I think we're woefully lacking, uh, both at higher education level and at schools, school education level, in really being able to provide good teaching. I noticed one of the questions in the chat was about all very well, Tim, to speak about a need for an A-level in Chinese civilization, but who is actually going to teach that? I think that's an important question. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, David. It's a rather chastening view we have to pay attention because there just aren't enough teachers 
what is needed is just a, what we call a basic platform of knowledge to enable people to evaluate the need for better relations. Um, couple, I'm, I'm going to bunch a couple of or three questions now. Um, Tom White is asking, uh, does the Gaokao, which is the university entrance exam, um, help to make young people in China mature, independent and successful, or does it cause unnecessary stress, uh, negatively affect childhood and unfair competition? What can the UK learn from China and the Gaokao? Uh, perhaps um, Lucy could answer that. Yeah, thank you, Benaby. Um, actually, I meant, already mentioned about Gaokao in my last, uh, you know, the uh, talk. Um, I think, uh, how to say, um, every every coin has two has two sides. But I just know Gaokao might not be suitable for other countries like UK. But um, that's the best choice so far. Uh, for current China situation, because you cannot imagine a country with 1.4 1, 1, 1. billion people. And, uh, you know, so everyone, um, are, most of them are very, uh, how to say, ambitious and uh, want to change their life uh, or maintain their, their self, the, maintain their class by, uh, you know, through the uh, Gaokao, the college entrance examination, um, the only way they can do is to study hard and to um, um, uh, get a good score in the exam. Of course, um, every exam, every exam, no matter where, no matter in China, in the UK, in other countries, as long as you use the, uh, how to say, summative exam as the the measuring and uh, rule, me measuring and uh, standard, then it's of course unavoidably um, will cause some negative things. For example, um, maybe it's um, too overwhelmed stress and some maybe bad competition or caused some um, anxiety or any other mental problems um for for the ch for the children for the students right um mm -hmm. but it's it's not that only china the, the exam in china cause that i can say because i used to work in south korea for one year as well so um in a in a secondary school i can see the the comp the uh, severe the 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 the, the com com competition for the same college entrance examination in South Korea even even more severe than in China. So mm -hmm. I know the the students I taught there, you know, um, everyone, most of them, um, after the school, um, if the school normally finish at five p.m. in South Korea and this, and similar in the, in China. But the, the, the students in South Korea, most of them have to go to the private institutions in late in the evening to study, yes. especially study math and English yes. um, till midnight. So in the midnight, you still can see many students uh, having the school bags and walking around to the town center and, and, and walking from home to go home. And this every day they have to do this. So this is not something, um, and as a Chinese, Chinese, um, and a Chinese man, I just feel too shocked to see this when I first see this in South Korea. But actually, it's very common in South Korea. If you don't do that, there is a saying in South Korea that if you um, um, sleep um, over five hours per day, then you cannot go to a good university. So that's even more severe the competition than in China. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is the common in most of the East Asian countries, I would like to say, but mm, there's a reason behind it. First, the, the, the large population and the, you know, the competitions to fears. Mm. And, uh, but, but that's, as I already mentioned before, that's the only way to select the, mm. the good, you know, the, the one outstanding uh, students. And, and uh, there's only equal and a fair way to give to all the Chinese, uh, young people, no matter of their um, back family background or social status, 
yeah so thank you yes it's um it's it's a world of ruthless competition isn't it yeah does it how much of this does it have to do with face do you think about self-esteem and uh, and and your 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 image in the world and your, your standing mm -hmm. It has some benefits. I mm. mean, um, because um, memor only can memorizing just the stereotype of a um, Chinese way of learning. But mm. actually, in the re um, recent years, the government already noticed this and would like to improve. You know, by maybe adding more other things like uh, cultural and uh, other yeah. um, more voluntary activities and trying yeah. to, uh, you know. Um, I think learn from the Western countries to really? combine to their own. Yeah. So I will say it has some benefits, especially to improve your uh, learning attitude and the your habit of learning by yourself, your self-discipline and also your strong will. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. So here's an interesting question, probably for Tim. Um, this is uh, a question from Matthew Hurst, who says he's, he's, he's really deep into studying Mandarin, doing a master's at the moment. And he'd always felt that his interest was welcome. And the question is, how can China make itself more approachable and friendly and cheaper to study? How can it make itself more friendly? Approachable and friendly. He finds it's not very friendly. <laughs> um. But perhaps that's not your experience. Yeah, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not sure. I sort of totally agree with the premise of the question, so it's a bit difficult for me to answer it. Well, I suppose uh, the premise is that he's trying to make a big effort, but he doesn't. Um, he's not. He's not being facilitated, as it were. Um, yeah. Um, my my experience was that if you if you kind of went into ordinary life in China, people were very welcoming. So the structures like the university structures and all that kind of stuff are not so welcoming. But whenever I um, you know, went out and just chatted with people in the street, you yeah. get a tremendously positive reaction because people, well, A, a lots of people wanted to uh, practice English, yeah. um, which is always a problem for me. So I always used to go to kind of the worst restaurant I could find, just sit there because yeah. you'd, sort of, you'd be less likely to find people there who spoke um, English. Yeah. Um, so I kind of get it's a bit austere and a bit kind of difficult, but I mean, if you, do, I, I personally find if you just talk to ordinary people, yeah, chat with ordinary people, you know, that's the best way to practice your Mandarin. And also, you normally get a really positive response. I mean, you sort of just literally just say ni hao, and people just all over you because you say Mandarin's absolutely marvelous and all the rest of it. You know, imagine if you're kind of a Norwegian, you come to the UK and sort of stammer through a few sentences, no one would even bat an eyelid. Ah. Uh, here's a very interesting, forgive me for indulging uh, my family, but I have a question for my daughter in Vancouver, uh, which is an interesting one. Um, the UK education system has been seen as a global standard for a long time, but with technological developments in this century, uh, along with uh, it's increasing, well, it, it is increasingly not fit for purpose for the jobs of the future, perhaps positioning Chinese business studies and getting students to learn about fintech and e-commerce business model strategies of companies like Alibaba and Tencent and ByteDance will be better supported. What do you make of that, David? I think those remarks are very well made. Um, yeah. I do, I mean, can I just pick up on the uh, earlier question as well about Gaokao? Um, because it's very clear that the ability of young Chinese in mathematics and anything that's related to quantification is higher. You know, we've only got to look at the PISA um, comparisons. Um, Shanghai young people are um, a year or two years ahead of uh, British students uh, by the time they're 12 years old, something like that. Um, and I do think that there are certain things which uh, the Chinese education system can teach the British education system. That doesn't mean that Gaokao is a perfect examination. And certainly some of the um, interesting experiments in mixing collectivism 
and uh, private interest and private market mechanisms. There was mention in the question about uh, Tencent and Alibaba and so on. You know, some of these innovations are astonishing and really we must take more notice of them. And we must ensure that when Chinese students come to our universities, uh, they don't learn old things, they learn new things and things about future. Uh, that's really important for the British higher education system to maintain its reputation for quality. That reputation for quality uh, was hard earned over probably more than a century, um, but it won't last forever if it's squandered. So it, it needs a renewal. Yeah, no, thanks very much, Attorney Apazin. Um, a question here for, or a piece of advice really, for uh, Teresa, uh, Brian Sitch has suggested that you might like to make greater contact with museums. Uh, she says particularly the one he knows in Manchester uh, and other partnership institutions have rich Chinese collections. In other words, in raising awareness of things Chinese and history and culture. Have you thought of doing that? We, we certainly have. And um, we had a, a, a pilot schools project in Liverpool where we went to have a look at all the collections in the Liverpool museums. And, and made sure that we included them when we had one of our challenge days so that they knew there was, they could go to these museums at a later date with, their, their, um, with the class um, just to see these objects for, in, you know, for real. Um, and it inspired them that, you know, the, for example, Shanghai and Liverpool have a huge connection. So we really built on the local Chinese connections when we go into different schools in different areas. But I'd, I'd love to speak to Brian and find out about how we can um, get information, contents, whatever it is for our challenge days um, about the Manchester Museums. That would be very interesting. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess. Um, can, I, can I just add another thing? In order to inspire um, some of the pupils about what's happening in China, we have a, a, a sort of a part of our challenge days talking about the entrepreneurs, talking about Alibaba and saying, giving the background of some of these entrepreneurs and how, you know, they came from very humble beginnings and they've created these huge, huge global companies. And yep. it, a lot of the pupils get very excited about that. We're saying to them, you know, in more impoverished parts of the UK, look, you too can do this. Look at what's happening. And um, they, they, the teachers love it. Yeah, absolutely. Can I also add something? Um, talking about China collection, um, actually, um, our Confucius Institute also helping um, to do a China collection of um, of ex ex expression in John Island's library in September this year. So it was delayed because of a pandemic, but we plan to do it in September. So if anyone's interested, so just uh, welcome to John Lyon Library to see the collection. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, we're nearing the end, so I'll give um, as many panelists as want to address this question a chance to do so. It's, it's a fairly, it's an old, um, um, well-worn saying that um, we tend to incline in the West towards the humanities at the expense of science, probably. And I'm guilty of that. Um, the question is, uh, what can you say about the status of science versus the humanities subjects in China? Is there a balance? Perhaps I'll ask Lucy first. You think science versus humanities, is there a balance in the study? Uh, I'm not an expert of, uh, I haven't, done any research regarding this but uh, well, from, from my, your own experience. <laughs> yeah according to my experience uh, you know and the students in Chinese secondary schools they need to uh, divide like let be like a GCC like you need to choose five subjects right but in China you need to choose two 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 kinds of the a series of courses you need to study. One is the humanity courses, including like languages, literature, and uh, politics and biology, politics and geography. And another uh, type is uh, the science, uh, yeah. uh, science courses, for example, physics, chemistry, and uh, you know, um, 
I forgot. So, so um, each 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 type contains several courses, and uh, you have to make the decision in the beginning of the secondary school. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, senior high, and then uh, once you decide it, you need to just study these uh, courses, and then that will uh, be the content in the Gaokao. So, I I guess guess normally, and uh, in my secondary school, there are eight courses or uh, eight classes a uh, groups of students in my secondary school but uh, only one one class is uh, humanities i'm um, yeah. one of them so yeah. that means that more people are you know more tend to choose science subjects because there are saying in china in the 80s and 90s that if you study science subjects then you got no fair in the in in, in the future no fair right. in the future so that means um, science subjects is really more popular um, in China. Yes, well, that's really the spirit of the of, of the um, of the what? How would you best phrase this? Of the age, in the sense that you see the, the amount of, of new patents being produced by Chinese scientists. There is a terrific hunger for uh, knowledge and, and usable knowledge. Um, and so new systems and devices have to be patented first and there's a um so science is really the spirit of the age in china isn't it at the moment but do you find that when you come over to the west uh, do you see the point of the humanities uh, rather more mm. uh, well because i yeah. haven't uh, studied in secondary school in the uk so it's hard to yeah, say but I mean, to the extent uh, studied uh, history and languages and philosophy yeah. Actually, regarding foreign languages, um, everyone knows that, um, like Chinese, for example, Chinese young people, they they studied English as a compulsory subject yeah. when in secondary school, and maybe now from primary school. So everyone can speak a little bit English, uh, especially young people in China. True, so, yeah. And also some people study uh, different foreign languages, but people here, um, I think the the enthusiasm for study of foreign language is not as much as that in some other countries, especially like China or other countries. Um, well, but other humanity subjects, uh, I actually I I, I cannot uh, because I, I I'm not I'm, I don't know very well. <laughs> so, well, for example, did you did you study any European history in school? Um, yes, we studied that in secondary school. Well, there you are, you see, you're ahead of the game. Yeah? <laughs> mm. Well, yeah, okay, well, well, in the last uh, five or so minutes, let's um, have a, a bit of a, a, a ring around and, and get um, a bit of conclusion to our discussions. It's very clear to me that um, we are woefully behind in addressing the really blinding need to know China better and Chinese thinking and where the Chinese are coming from. Uh, Tim is making uh, manful strides in that direction, and I hope they will eventually bear fruit, eventually, um, and has my full support. Um, do you think, David, that uh, the more could be done in terms of, I don't know, persuading um, Chinese authorities of the need to understand the Western mindset rather better in terms of, well, I suppose in terms expressed through history and philosophy and um, probably to point up the need for better dialogue through gaining the vocabulary of discussion necessary to to reach agreement on things like um, climate change and um, all these things that are besetting us. Yeah, I, I, I think we have to accept that the modern Chinese university system is really very recent. Uh, People should be aware, I think, that there were no ancient universities in China um, because there was civil service examinations. It really wasn't. I mean, higher learning was all about rote learning uh, yeah. to pass civil service examinations. Mm -hmm. So it's not until um, the, the 20th century that there is anything like a modern university system and that is born out of the need to try and modernize. And really the, the higher education system as a whole in China now is something that originates from the 1980s. So it's only had 40 years. We shouldn't be too hard on the Chinese if they haven't yet developed 
all the kinds of things that they will be developing yeah. in, in the future. Um, many Chinese students, of course, want to study subjects that they're good at. They're well taught in science and mathematics and so on. So they want to study those subjects and they know that those subjects uh, plus business and management will lead to a good career. So that's what they tend to specialize in. Uh, mm. My university's got a, a double degree with Beijing Foreign Studies University, which is actually in the field of diplomatic studies. Right. And we have no problem in recruiting to that. Mm. And also I would say, that the students who are working on that uh, are giving uh, assessments, providing their essays and examinations uh, to just as high a standard as, as our UK students on the same kind of programme. So I, I think that that's very impressive. Uh, but this is perhaps at an elite institution and for people who did very well in their Gaokao examinations and who were very well motivated. Uh, perhaps it's different in different ability ranges. Yeah, no, surely. Thank you. Um, right. Um, we are agreed that something more has to be done and quite how to do this and how to get more people on side to make this happen. We have, um, I hope listening in somebody from government. I, as you mentioned Tom Tugan had earlier. Um, he has his own ideas and very understandably. Um, the other person that we were in touch with, Richard Graham of the All Party China Group, um, having done time on the ground is a bit more knowledgeable and, and more able to assess the need to engage more and better with China. Um, I hope this uh, panel discussion has had some impact on people who are of a mind to encourage people to take greater interest in China and fomenting better relations through acquaintance, through people to people contact, for goodness sake. It's not easy to go there, particularly with, with COVID, but at least the people who are here from China uh, need to be, um, what is the word, um, not just befriended, but but uh, understood and engaged with. Um, part of the problem I realize with students is that the Chinese and the men don't much like drinking and therefore getting them down the pub is a, is quite a problem and a challenge, uh, I found. Once you do that and they've, they've acclimatized to drinking a half can of, of bitter, then perhaps you can get them talking. But in the universities, there are, I was amazed, my own college, um, there are now many students from Oxford in Oxford who are, are, are women and have done terribly well and have become uh, academics over here because they probably realize the, the missing link in terms of on the humanities side that life is more than simply getting a job and being you know, very good at your profession. Uh, to get a life is a rather more important and this is I think what the West can contribute to the Chinese. Anyway, I leave that hanging in the air as a, as a proposition. Mm -hmm. Comments, please. <laughs> Silence. Okay. Um, now, thank you all very much. It's been a wonderful discussion. Um, I apologize to people whose questions have not been directly addressed. Um, I hope that this will have had the effect of sparking people's minds as to what more they can do to, in, to help people engage with China. Uh, Tim has recommended, recommended a couple of books. Um, those of, the, of you who have not had questions answered, we will hope to uh, satisfy uh, by email later. Um, I know that Eventbrite have uh, collected and, and will uh, attempt to let us know which these are. Um, in the meantime, um, you could do worse in taking your first step than to join SACU, which uh, it, it organizes many events of this type and does organize trips to China and has a lot of experts on the ground here who are very happy to share their knowledge. Um, there is um, a discouraging feeling in the country that uh, at the moment China is something of a threat, which of course is understandable for those who are ignorant of so much that, uh, of China's standing in the world and, and the need basically to engage with it. And I hope this small discussion has, has given some courage to those who have an interest to try and further that study. So it just remains to me to thank our panelists, uh, Teresa and Lucy, David and Tim, um, and hope that you will consider joining Saku uh, as a first step if you haven't already. And I leave now and hang over uh, basically um, to, um, to Zoe and our organizing committee for which I, I thank you very much for
providing the technical support and um, close the study session and hope to hear more of, of you and from you in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.